Hi guys, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Ksenia and I make videos for people who like myself are going through the family immigration process. I'm not an immigration attorney. My videos are based on publicly available information, my own experience and the experience of my subscribers. And the purpose of my channel is to give you guys the confidence to go through this process completely on your own. In today's video, I would like to talk about some common mistakes that I see people make on the affidavit of support form I-864 so that you can avoid them in your case. And before we proceed with this video, I want to direct you guys to my I-864 dedicated playlist. In addition, I have a dedicated video on how to avoid requests for evidence for this particular form where I talk more about supporting documents and evidence. But in today's video in particular, I wanted to touch upon some specific parts of the actual form where I see people make the most mistakes. First and foremost, the petitioner will almost always have to fill out the affidavit of support even if the petitioner has zero income and will use a co-sponsor. In the case that you are using a joint sponsor, you will have to have the joint sponsor fill out an additional affidavit of support and include it with your packet and all the supporting evidence and documents required from the joint sponsor. However, as the petitioner, you will also have to include the affidavit of support and you're still going to have to include the evidence from the most recent tax year to demonstrate the exact reason why you are unable to be a sponsor in this case. I I often see this be a huge issue when a petitioner, for example, petitions their parent and the petitioner doesn't make enough income, but their spouse actually makes enough income to sponsor the parents. So what they do is they will have the spouse fill out the affidavit of support as if from their own behalf. In this situation, the sponsor, even if they make zero income, even if they file taxes jointly with their spouse, the petitioner is the one to fill out the affidavit of support. And from then you see if you should be including your spouse as a household member. And again, I have a video on the household members and their responsibilities and how to fill out that form as well. So definitely check that out. Next mistake I see is in part one when it comes to selecting one of the options of who exactly is filling out the affidavit of support. And as you will notice, there is a lot of different options. As I mentioned earlier, since the petitioner will have to fill out the affidavit of support, then in that case, the petitioner will always sign off as option 1A, I am the petitioner. And then if you as the petitioner are using a joint sponsor, so a person who's not really related to you, an additional person, a friend, a co-worker that will be contributing their income, then in that case, the joint sponsor will select the option 1D. I'm the only joint sponsor. I see a lot of confusion when, for example, the petitioner uses a joint sponsor and on the actual form in part one, they select an option 1E, which says I am the first or the second of the joint sponsors because they assume that now that there is a petition and a joint sponsor and then there's two joint sponsors that's actually not the case it is very very rare when a case would be allowed to use two joint sponsors which means two additional people to the petitioner who are joining together to sponsor a, a large group of immigrants when they split them between the two i personally have never seen option 1e being actually utilized which actually brings me to my next point which is another point where i see people make a lot of mistakes and that is assuming that the petitioner's income and the joint sponsor's incomes can be combined that's not true. In fact, if the petitioner doesn't make enough income to sponsor the intending immigrant based on the petitioner's household size, then in that case, the joint sponsor that they ask for support must be able to, in their entirety, sponsor the intending immigrant based on their own household size. So the joint sponsor's household size plus the intending immigrant. Next big mistake I see is page two, part three of the form, especially items 4A and so forth. So the whole page two of the form asks you if you are sponsoring the people in this affidavit and also additional family members that are coming along. This is where I see people include the names of family members in question 4A and so forth. Um, for example, if they are petitioning both of their parents, what I will see is they will include the name of the second parent in that 
part on page two. So you need to be reading the questions and the prompts very carefully. The question on that page clearly states that if you have submitted a separate petition for a relative, you do not write their name and not part of the form. So for example, if you're petitioning both of your parents and the affidavit of support that you're filling out right now is for your mom, your dad's name will not be written in that part of the form and vice versa. Because as a US citizen, you're supposed to be filing separate petitions for each parent. I've also seen people try to write the names of their minor siblings in that part of the form. If for example, they're filing for their parents, they assume that minor siblings will be included on the petition and also will be included in the affidavit of support, which is in fact not true. A US citizen must file a separate petition for each eligible relative, which means that minor siblings are never included as derivatives or dependents on your parents' green card cases. The reason why it is so important to fill out this page correctly is because on the next page in question 29, you will be asked to count the total number of people sponsored in this affidavit based on the number of people you have listed in the previous pages. If you are submitting an affidavit of support for one person, such as your mom, for example, it will not count your dad because your dad has a separate petition. So in this case, you will only put number one in there. If however, you're sponsoring your sibling and your sibling's entire family is coming to the United States, then in that case, yes, your sibling is eligible to have derivatives and then you will have to select uh, question two or three, whichever applies to your situation and provide your siblings derivatives names in those parts. So if you are still confused about who to write, not to write in this part, I highly encourage you to review pages one and two of the form I-130 instructions, which tell you exactly which categories of immigrants or relatives are eligible to have derivatives and which ones are not. Okay, moving on to page four, let's talk about household size this is where I also see a lot of people make some significant mistakes and this part of the form requires more extensive explanation which is why I have a dedicated video with examples for most common situations that I see on how to properly calculate the household size and the other thing about the household size where I see a lot of mistakes is that the form itself when you're filling it out on your computer is broken it auto populates number one in the total household size unfortunately Unfortunately. And there are ways to easily fix it. I have made two videos showing how to fix this error. It is very important that you type out these numbers correctly and neatly. And it is very important that you do not write over the total number in pen uh, because it will look messy and it may not look as clean and USCIS is very particular with that and they may very well issue you a request for evidence for something so insignificant. Okay, the next mistake that I frequently see is also on page four in lines eight through 10, part six of the application. I see sponsors or petitioners here in lines eight, nine, and 10, including the names of their spouses, even if their spouse actually makes zero income. And sometimes I actually see people physically write in line 10, zero. So you, again, need to read the question prompt very carefully. The question prompt is asking you to include any household members who will be contributing their income. So if your household member doesn't have any income, you do not write their name in this part. And even if this is something that seems very insignificant to you, I have seen so many cases where people receive a request for evidence from USCIS or they receive a message on the NVC portal asking them to provide tax return information from their spouse and asking them to upload their spouse's I-864A. A lot of petitioners are confused why they're asking for that. And I always go back and I look at their affidavit of support form and I always see them list their spouse in this part of the form in lines eight through 10. And that is why they're now being requested to provide that information. That's why you have to be very careful who's name you're writing in what part of the form. You should only be writing people here, first of all, household members, second of all, household members who will be contributing their income to yours. Next, 
mistake that I see is on page five, questions 21 and 22. This again is um, sometimes where people will check off either question one or question 22 or sometimes both without even reading what the question says. The questions specifically ask you to analyze the information that you have put on the previous page and then if you have any household members that you have listed on the previous page, you will then need to select either box 21 or 22 depending on that situation. If you have nobody written on the previous page other than yourself, you shouldn't be checking those boxes at all. And again, if you are confused about what it means, if you're not comfortable with what those questions actually state, I encourage you to really take your time, read the form instructions, review the guides, just to make sure that you understand what exactly those questions are asking of you before you check them off. Because remember, every single question that you check off will come with a question from USCIS or the NVC if you can't provide that evidence. Next is also on page five, and this is lines 24A through C. This is a very common mistake that I see from a lot of people, and that is not writing the correct amount in those lines. These lines ask you specifically to write your total income as it is exactly written on your income tax returns or your tax transcripts. If you are providing copies of your tax returns, which is the IRS form 1040, then in that case, you will write whatever is written on line nine of that form. If you are looking at your tax transcript, it is usually on the second page where you will find your total income. Sometimes I see people either write an estimate here or they will write whatever is written on their W-2s, which sometimes it matches, but sometimes it doesn't. It is very, very easy to receive a request for evidence when these particular lines, 24A through C, are not written correctly. And finally, this is more of a clerical mistake that I see that can also cause a lot of issues for you down the line or delay your case. And that is one, not signing the form in black ink. When they say black ink, they literally mean just a black pen. So that is one thing that I see they often reject um, applications that are not written, that are not signed in black pen. And they also don't accept electronic signatures. They will only accept pen signatures. Even if on the USCIS site, if you read about signatures, it will say that they do accept electronic signatures and this and that. In reality, they reject applications that are not signed in pen. So you can upload a scanned copy of that application, obviously. And to your consular interview, you can also bring a copy. So you don't actually have to have your petitioner or your joint sponsor send you the original affidavit of support. So I hope that you found this video useful. I hope that you um, maybe were able to catch some of the mistakes that you made in your forms to avoid further delays. Let me know if you have any additional questions. Before you comment though, I highly encourage that you check out the playlist that I made, which will probably answer most, if not all of your questions. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Give this video a thumbs up and I hope to see you guys in my next videos. Bye.